to our sermon this morning. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. This morning, we come across the story of Jesus healing a paralegic, a paralyzed man on top of dealing with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So there's it's all these multiple things. It's never easy with Jesus, as we've been finding out. It's never just one issue when he is doing his thing. It's always a multiplicity of things. I want to take a few minutes to give some background on Pharisees. Because as we continue to walk, take our slow roll through the book of Luke, Jesus will encounter these guys a lot. He's going to encounter them more than just the Pharisees. But I'm going to talk about the Pharisees this morning because that's what's in our text. When we get to the other names of the groups, we will do a little bit on that. So what I want to do is share about three minutes on what the Pharisees are, who they are, okay? Now, the background I'm sharing with you comes from a number of sources pulled together to give a realistic view of the environment in which Jesus was dealing with. So the four sources I'm going to give you is I took bits and pieces, put it into my own words, whatever, but I, I have to tell you where I got the information, okay? So the first source is John MacArthur's Study Bible. The second source is J. Vernon McGee's Through the Bible's com Commentary. The third source is um, Tony Evans' Bible Commentary. And the fourth source is Warren Wiersbe's The Bible Expo Exposition Commentary. I do a lot of reading, obviously, to, to get to make sure that when I stand before God's people, I am talking God's word, okay? And so it's important that you know that what I'm going to share with you about the Pharisees comes from these brothers who've done deep study. And this by no means, by no means, is a deep, dark dive. This is just a couple of things about the Pharisees so as we mention them through our text, you get an understanding of who they were, okay? But by no means is this a deep dive at all. That's a, like a Sunday school class for us to really get into that, okay? The name Pharisee is a he, in Hebrew means separated ones, separate ones. That's what it means. Pharisees, for the most part, came from middle-class Jewish families for, for the laity, they were mostly businessmen. They were not priests or Levites, okay? They were not priests or Levites. They were middle-class dudes. They were mostly businessmen. Pharisees were highly zealous for ritual and religious purity according to the Mosaic Law. They loved the Mosaic Law. By the way, the Mosaic Law is the law that Moses gave, the Ten Commandments, okay? Now, that's where it gets interesting. Because as I tell you that they love the Mosaic Law, listen to what they did to it. The Pharisees added 603 laws and, and commandments to the original Ten Commandments God gave Moses. So on one hand, they love the Ten Commandments and what Moses laid out. But on the other hand, they created 603 new commandments and rituals, okay? Um, commandments, which came to a total of 613 total commandments the Pharisees imposed on the Israelites in the temple. Okay? That's what they did. Pharisees represented the, ox the orthodox core of Judaism and really influenced the common people in Israel. They had a lot of clout, guys. A lot of clout. Jesus usually rebuked them. Now, it's interesting. I'm going to give you the text. Jesus usually rebuked the Pharisees. For they, Jesus rebuked them for using human tradition to nullify Scripture as well as calling them out for, the, for their hypocrisy. Jesus always was right there, okay, calling them out. They were hypocrites. And they basically created rules and rituals to satisfy themselves. God gave the Ten Commandments. That's all he gave. So what did Jesus do? Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. 
Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says this, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God. He is not to honor his father with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Those were the Pharisees. So every time you read your Bible, you, get, you have a bigger sense of who these guys were. They were really just bad guys, okay? Please give a warm welcome to Sister Danelle Dimitri as she comes to the platform to read this morning's text. Please pull out your Bibles or your devices, whatever you use. We're a Bible teaching church, so we want you to see it and read it for yourself. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, Why reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, this, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he arose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for the opportunity just to share some time in your word this morning. I ask you, Heavenly Father, that you teach all of us, Lord God, as you teach me as we put this together, of how magnificent you are, the majesty of Christ. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that um, you just so move in our congregation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take this verse by verse. Verse 17. As you can tell, Dimitri is a King James sister, okay? This is from the NIV. One day as, we, as he was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea Jerus- and Jerusalem were sitting there and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. The power of the presence of the Lord were in him. He was ready, okay? He was ready. He knew what was coming. 
God had prepared him, just like God prepares every one of you. God prepares our team on Thursday nights whenever we have American Heritage Girls and Trill Life Boys. God prepares the team who is rehearsing for music. God prepares the team for service this morning. A team of people have to make this happen. God prepares those when he calls you to minister. Just a couple of quick points concerning verse 17. Whenever Jesus spoke, there were always those who sat and were suspicious. They were, I mean, they were spectators. They were just spectators. They were coming to see what this guy is going to say. Okay? They, weren't, they didn't necessarily come to learn. They didn't necessarily come to get blessed. They were spectators. They were coming to see what was going to happen. What was going to happen? Never really listening or learning. They just wanted to say, I was there. I was there. Now, sometimes being there in your own life for certain things that are important to you are big deals. They're big deals. I remember Kalia Skrimsky's last game at Fenway Park. And I was sitting in the reserved grandstands on the Red Sox dugout side. And as Yaz ran around Fenway and waved goodbye, I sat there with my best friend Eric Schulman and we cried like babies. We cried like babies as Yaz was running around saying goodbye. Okay? So people come to see Jesus. Some of them came to get healed. Some of them came as spectators. What's this guy going to do? What's going to happen today? Then you had people. There are, all, there, are all, there are also people there to be critical of Jesus, to be critical of his teaching, to be critical of his delivery, to be critical. Did he do it right? Did he say it right? And every preacher, every teacher of God's word will tell you that that's every audience we have. You see, nothing has changed. When Jesus was talking and teaching, the people in the audience are the same as the people in this audience and every audience. There are some who came because they want to hear from God. They are eager. They see the Lord is working in their life. There are some who come who are hurt who are looking for a healing, looking for a word from one of the songs that are being said, looking for something that is being taught so that the Lord can help them and heal them. And then there are some who are just coming to say, what's this dude all about? Spectators. Then there's that few that are the Pharisees. They come to criticize. They want to make sure that Jesus is talking and doing and saying things according to what they feel. Being a critic is a dangerous place to be when you come to worship service. You see, the Pharisees could have learned something there with Jesus, but they chose to criticize him. Judge him. Remember what Paul said in Romans about judging someone's ministry, about judging someone's servants, people who are serving the Lord. Be careful how you judge them. When they're doing it for the Lord, be careful how you judge them. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 14, verse 4. Who are you to judge anyone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. You know what that means? You know what that means? Guys, I love you being here. I do. I love us growing. I do. But every Sunday, I preach to one person. I preach to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. When our team is up there singing, they're singing to one person. They're singing to the Lord Jesus Christ. We serve him. We serve him. And the rest of the scripture says, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Be careful how you criticize God's people. Be careful. Let's move on. Luke chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. 
Some men came carrying a paralegic, a, paral a paralegic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Okay, before we even talk about that, think about that. You know, sometimes when I'm reading God's word, I put myself in the story. I, I do. I literally put myself in the story. So what would I do if I was there and Jesus was teaching and I start seeing dust fly? Because there's no way that you can put a hole in the roof without some dust flying, right? I don't care what it's made out of. So all of a sudden you see dust fly and you look up and you then start and you watch this. You're watching this. What a scene. Would you be there saying, let's see if they can make it happen? Or would you be one of the persons running over trying to help? I'm just asking. I'm not asking you to answer me. I'm just asking. These men took three steps in seeking forgiveness and healing from Jesus. They took three steps. By the way, these are the same steps these are the same steps us sinners had to take to receive forgiveness from our Lord. They took three steps. What was the first step? Step number one, they sought help. They sought help. When we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, most of us were a mess. We were a bona fide mess. No matter where we were in our life, Whatever we were doing was not working. We were a mess. You may have not been a mess to others. You may have been very successful. Great job, great education, nice house, beautiful wife, the kids. But internally, your heart was a mess. It was a mess. And when we came to Christ, that was the moment. That was that moment that we admitted that we were a mess. Lord, help me. I remember saying those words in my kitchen. Jesus, if you're real, if you are who they say you are, would you please save me? Because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, I don't have just, I'm not the only one with that story, kind of a story. Many of us have that story. Many of us. They sought help. The, peril, the paralegic, paralegic had to find some friends to carry him as they were all seeking Jesus. Have you ever asked anybody to help you move? <laughs> all of a sudden, you, all your friends are like, well, you know, I, I got to go shopping. <laughs> nobody likes to move. And nobody likes to help people move. Now, can you imagine this paralyzed man asking three of his friends to help him go see Jesus? They knew he couldn't walk. They knew they had to carry him. Right? So their need was just as much as the paralyzed man. There was no way the paralyzed, the paralegic, paralegic could fight his way through the crowd to see Jesus. It is necessary, it is always necessary to seek Jesus in our, in our time of great need and desperation. That's the time that we can seek. That's the right time. That's when the heart is right. Many people have a testimony, like my wife. She grew up in a Christian home. She went to church every Sunday in Sunday school, part of all of the ministries in church, went to summer camp, did all of those things, and just knew because she understood who Jesus was, because her family always put her in the environment that a Bible teaching church that preached Christ, that for her to come to Christ, it was the right thing to do. And many of you staring at me had that kind of a testimony. You didn't go through what some of us went through. Praise the Lord. By the way, the party is still the same. The Bible says that the angels will rejoice for every soul that comes to know Jesus. So the party is still the same. So if you came to know Christ in the bottom of a jail cell, 
after a drunken stupor and you gave your life to Christ, the angels are partying. If you came to Christ as a teenager or as a 12-year-old girl like my wife and you understood who Jesus was and you accepted him as his Lord and Savior, the party is the same in heaven. There is no different party. You're a soul that came to Christ. That's what these men were seeking. They didn't know exactly, but they knew Jesus could help them. Here's what the Bible says about seeking the Lord. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If you are seeking after God, you will find him. If you are seeking after God. Now, I know that many of you, most of you are not wired like me. You're not. That you're not supposed to be. Because God wired all of us differently. But I turn that around. When I'm talking to someone involved in a cult, do you know what the easiest lead in to tell them about Jesus is? Use the cult against them. I say, John, you have a desire to seek God or you wouldn't be here. The problem is they can't lead you to the God you're looking for. Let me show you the God that you're looking for. It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul did. Remember on Mars Hill? He walked around and saw all of these tokens of worship and then there was a, there was a statue or something that's, you know, to the unknown God. And what did Paul do? Paul said, I want to tell you about the unknown God. I see that you're a holy people, that you want to find God. I see that you're doing all kinds of things to get to God. Let me tell you who God is. They were seeking. Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me, and those who seek me, find me. Those who seek me, find me. Those who seek me, find me. Step two, these men believed and had faith and confidence in Jesus' power to forgive sins and to heal. They didn't know how. None of us know how. When I gave my life to Christ in my, the middle of my kitchen that Wednesday night at 2 o'clock in the morning, I didn't know how it was going to happen. I just knew that I needed him. I just knew that I, I wasn't, I, I, internally I was a mess. No, I didn't levitate. I didn't rise off the floor and start floating around the kitchen. But I was different. The power of the Holy Spirit, I was different in an instant. The weight of all the things that I was going th th through at the time were lifted off my shoulders. I don't know how God did that. The problems didn't go away. They just were no longer a burden. Does that make sense? They were easier to deal with. Do you have faith and confidence in Jesus' power? Don't answer that question. I'm just asking it. Do you have faith in the power of of Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible says. Romans 15, 13. May the God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We as Christians, we as believers should never, ever, ever lose hope. We should never lose hope. Because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. For those who that may sound for the first time, like, what is he talking about? I'm talking about that's what a Christian is. A Christian isn't a person that goes to church every Sunday, or goes to Mass every Sunday, or goes to whatever church you go to every Sunday. That is not a Christian. That is a church-going person. A Christian 
is a person that knows that they're a sinner. They ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins. And because the Lord knows your heart, he knows your heart. When you ask him to forgive you, he will forgive you. And in an instance, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit indwells your body, that's what makes you a Christian. And when you become a Christian, the Bible becomes real to you. Before that point, the Bible was a history book. It was, a, it was what people, some people believe. But all of a sudden, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Bible comes alive. It is alive. It's true. It's true. I, I don't know if I told you this story, but I'm going to tell you again. If you heard it, when I became a Christian, and I started, I became a Christian on Wednesday night. I started discipleship on Friday night. And I gave my testimony on Saturday night. All in the same week. Okay? Because I started reading the Bible, I was doing a little quiet time in my house the next week. And I started, and then I started reading about the rainbow. And that God gave us the rainbow to remind us of the flood. That was revelation to me. I freaked out. Now, as you can see, I'm very shy. And so I ran up. Michelle was watching TV up in our bedroom, and I ran up. I said, Cakes, Cakes, do you know what a rainbow is for? And she goes, yeah, honey, that's God telling us that he's never going to destroy the earth by water. And I said, you knew that? You knew that? And you didn't tell me that? <laughs> she knew she was married to a crazy man, but that just solidified everything. The Bible becomes real, guys. Because the job of the Holy Spirit in your body is to help you interpret God's word so that we can live for him. We become more Christ-like every day. Yes, we fail. Yes, we sin. Yes, we go through all of that. Joshua 1.9. Joshua 1.9 happens to be my wife's favorite verse. It is her favorite verse. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He will be with you wherever you go. Just because I'm a, I'm a hard-headed person, that's when I really solidified. He's with me because I have his Holy Spirit that dwells in me. So wherever I go, the Holy Spirit in me, he's with me. That's a true statement, guys. Joshua 1.9 is a true statement. Be courageous. I am with you. I know what you're going through. Don't worry about it. I am with you. Step number three. Those men persisted in getting to the finish line to get Jesus they persisted. They jumped up on the roof, cut a hole in the tiles, and lowered this paralyzed man on his mat to the face of Jesus. Do you know what the modern-day lowering of the man is for us? You ready for this? Invite someone to church. Invite someone to church. Hey, what are you doing Sunday? Pick up at 9.30. Invite someone to church. Allow the Christians, look around you, look around you guys, look around the audience, look around. Allow the Christians, the spirit-filled people in this room to greet that new person and allow the Holy Spirit to do its thing. Don't you put that pressure on you. Just bring them to church. Just bring them to church. Pray about them coming to church with you and then allow the Lord to do their thing. That 
is cutting the hole in the roof that these men did for this paralyzed man. That's the modern day version. I believe Jesus was watching this thing happen right before his eyes. In their spirit of boldness and persistence in their broken state, Jesus was touched by their spirit of great need. Jesus saw. He knew their heart. These guys were willing to go outside, climb up on the roof, dig a hole in the roof, lower the man safely down in front of a crowd to see Jesus. Let me ask you a question. What do you think was going through the minds of the Pharisees as they were watching this? That was a whole other sermon that I started writing and I had to stop it because I only have a little bit of time to preach and the guy who taught me how to preach said to stay on topic. But think about that. What do you think the Pharisees were thinking? What were going through their minds? Jesus saw the faith of the paralegic man and his friends. The man who helped the, the paralyzed man reminded me of a couple of scriptures as I was reading it. I had to come back to the text because I, I, I have to work on staying with the text. So I came back to the text, and it reminded me of two scriptures of these men who helped the paralyzed man. Romans 15, 1 and 2. Romans 15, 1 and 2. We who are strong are to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. We are to help those. We are to help those. And don't even get me started. Don't even get me started about what's going on in our country and how we feel about people coming into our country and putting up all these fences. Uh, we should be helping. We should be the help, not the hindrance. And I'm going to leave it at that. That's for a, a, a time of a teaching of a whole nother time. But we should be helping those in need. Any way that we can. You heard Sister Rhiannon up here earlier. You heard her last week. Helping people in need. Now here's a really cool thing. Not everybody is wired like Sister Rhiannon. Okay? Helping people in need, need doesn't mean you do what she does. Helping people in need means that you ask the Father, what should you do? Some of you can get involved and write a check to one of the, the places that are helping people in need. Some of you can volunteer your time. I, it doesn't matter. God uses all of his people. And believe me, his people who can write a check, that is a blessing, guys. It's not a curse. It is a blessing from the Lord. So some of us can write a check. But all of us are responsible for helping those who are weak. Galatians 6, 9 says this, Let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time he will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Guys, when you are working in the ministry... When you are here working at, at, with the American Heritage Girls and all you're doing is helping clean up, or maybe you're helping in the classroom, maybe you're helping at the registration table. If you're here for Heritage, for um, Trail Life, and you're downstairs with the guys, and you see our leaders got it going on and it's really doing a great job, and you're there and you're going to jump in and you're outside playing with the boys, everything that you do is a blessing to the Lord. Stop looking at what you do and putting it on a scale. You do what you can do, and you will be blessed the same. I remember hearing a, a sermon by, by um, um, Billy Graham. I loved him. I loved Billy Graham. And I remember him talking about all of these great Christian leaders, and some people think that they're going to have more crowns because they're a great speaker. And he put that right to bed. 
He said, no, the Christian who lives their life and does according to what God's will is every day will have more crowns than that leader. You see, because God has called that leader to do what he's doing. God is fair. If we are working in our gift mix or our giftness, our giftness, then we are doing what we're supposed to do. You hear our music team. Gosh, every time I wish I could sing. Hey, this is never going to happen. Even with my surgery, my voice is not going to become raw. That's not going to happen. I can't carry a note in a bucket. At all. I am that text that says make a joyful noise. If you look it up in the Bible dictionary, it says Larry Smith. Okay? That's the truth. My point is this, guys. Every last person called to be a Christian, you have a function. If you're a mom and you're raising your children at home and you're trying to do what's right, guess what you've been called to? Doing what you're doing. Okay? So stop trying to live like other people or other things and be happy where the Lord has you. And when you do things according to his plan, let me tell you something. He honors it. He honors it. He honors it. That's the Lord that we serve, guys. That's the Lord that we serve. Don't miss the elephant in the room. Don't miss the elephant in the room. It was Jesus who said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Remember last week? Jesus forgave the paraplegic man of his sins. By doing this, Jesus showed his messiahship. Jesus, he proved his messiahship. When he says your sin are forgiven, the power to forgive. Only God has the power to forgive. Now what do you think the Pharisees were doing? Now what do you think they were doing? You learned a little bit about who they are. They're going crazy. This man is calling himself God. Acts 5, verses 31. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. That's who Jesus is. Let's finish up. Luke 21 to 26. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law begin thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Now remember, I'm, I'm back in this scene. I'm watching this. So at this point, the paralyzed man is still on the floor on his mat. He's still paralyzed. The crowd is still there. The Pharisees are over here. The spectators are all over the place. And Jesus says this to them. And he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and, walk, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them. Boop! Popped up. You know, it's like I was watching the NC2A tournament this weekend. And I have two bad knees. I've had two knee surgeries, two knee replacements. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching these young bloods, and I, I got the women's, um, the women's NCAA championship on ABC or NBC or, or, uh, or whatever, and I got the men's on, and I'm watching. And, I, and both times, you know, the Bible says jealousy is a sin. Okay? Jealousy is a sin. Both times, doesn't matter if it's the women playing or the men, they will fall on the floor and they pop up. I can't do that, guys. If I fall on the floor, I'm on the floor. 
and, I, and I'm watching them, I'm watching these kids pop up and down, fall to the ground and bop up and run down the court. And I'm going, did I do that? <laughs> That's what happened here. Jesus said, get up. This man was paralyzed. He got up, picked up his mat. And everyone's going, what? Really? Yeah, really. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things to get today. Listen, guys. Here's the guilt of the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew that only God had the power to forgive sins. They knew that. Remember, they knew the Mosaic law. They understood what Moses wrote. They added 300, 603 things just to make sure they knew. So they knew that this was God. They knew it. The problem is the Pharisees failed to see the Son of Man right before their eyes. So they knew it in their brain, but they didn't know it in their heart. Remember, remember guys, if, if anyone asks you, what are the toughest 12 inches in the world? There's a, with everybody, there's a tough 12 inches. That 12 inches is from your head to your heart. You may have the knowledge of what you're supposed to do, but until it reaches your heart, you are never going to behave the way you're supposed to behave. The Pharisees knew the law. They understood mentally that this could be or is the Savior. Remember, the, what we didn't cover is their education, and they had to memorize the book of Isaiah. They had to memorize that as part of their training. So they had the scriptures. It was in their head and never traveled to their heart. And that's what happens with a lot of people today. A lot of us, a lot of people that we love, they have the knowledge, but they refuse to have it walk the 12 inches to their heart. The problem is the Pharisees failed to see the Son of Man right before their eyes. You see, brothers and sisters, the Pharisees had the same problem many people in our families have. The same problem as some of our friends, relatives, co-workers. Belief in Jesus, God's one and only Son. Some people say, I believe in Jesus. They got the head knowledge but he hasn't traveled that 12 inches to make him Lord. Because making him Lord, that is when the sanctification starts the process of you changing who you are and becoming more Christ-like. That's the difference. That's the relationship that we have in Christ. I'm going to read a text. Everyone always stops at John 3.16. But I'm going to read John 3, 16 to 3, 20. Because it's the whole thing. And this is, what we're going to, this is your walking away point this morning. Please rise. Please rise. This is your walking away thought this morning. Just want to say this. This is the second Sunday that we witnessed by the power of Jesus' word, stuff happens. The power of Jesus' word, stuff happens. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But let me read John 3, 16 to 20 to end our time together this morning. And many of us know the John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Ah, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, 
But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. That's the truth. John 3.16 is the only text you need to know to know to become a brother or sister in Christ. But read the rest. It's powerful stuff. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you, Lord, and I thank you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for your written word this morning. I praise you, Heavenly Father, for what you showed us about salvation, Heavenly Father, that seeking you, seeking you, Heavenly Father, understanding that we need you, no matter what state we're in. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for dying on the cross for our sins so that we can receive the free gift of salvation and live eternity with you. For those of us who know you, Lord God, I ask you to continue to grow us one day at a time. We are all under construction. For those of us, for those who don't know you, Heavenly Father, who have been pondering a relationship, I pray that this morning was extremely clear, crystal clear, that you need Jesus, no matter where you are in your life. Thank you for the opportunity to be together with my brothers and sisters this morning. And I pray, Heavenly Father, once again, that none of us leave here the same as we walked in because we heard from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Cheryl.